that are of great concern to our community. Um, one is the services for our older adults. Uh, the West Side, I think, has the largest increase in population is among older adults. And uh, the needs are great. And so we have search and care here this evening to let us know what they do and, um, and how they do it, which is very important. And we have uh, the other ma really major thing, food, food insecurity, which is always our number one priority in the past few years. And we have the CEO and executive director, um, Greg Silverman, who will be on a little later. So we welcome him. So I, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Aaron Rooney, the Executive Director of Search and Care, and Robin Strachan, an old friend, okay, who uh, does a number of things. But I'll call you the outreach coordinator, okay? So <laughs> take it from here. Thank, thank you so much. It's truly a privilege to be invited to speak to you tonight. Um, you know, I sit on another community board and we don't do this. So I think that you're kind of, you're very innovative in addition to having the most important budget in the community. Um, may I please be able to share my screen? Sure. Thank you. Um, you know, I think the last time I came before you was probably July of 2021, which was of course in the middle of the pandemic when search and care at the urging of several of our funders um, Hold on just one second, share screen, thank you. What I want, right? Share. Thank you. Okay, great. Hey, thank you. Um, when, um, in the middle of the pandemic, when some of our funders said, um, slide show, when some of our funders said, um, there's a lot of older adults on the Upper West Side who are homebound and nobody's serving them, and that's your specialty. We really think that you should investigate it. And we did, and with a lot of help and with your help, um, I guess a year and a half later, we're, several, we're a few hundred clients into it. And um, we're seeing some similarities and some differences, but the most wonderful thing is um, the collaboration that we have on the Upper West Side. It's a little bit different than what we experienced in our home base, the East Side, which is where we started because um, We've been known there for 50 years and we're known, of course, to all the faith and the electeds and a lot of the other social service agencies, but we also have a small part in a um, DIFTA contract for Meals on Wheels. So we do get some clients from there. Um, but Aaron has been with us only since Thanksgiving. It's gone so quickly. Um, you, you have to um, have a lot of respect for this gentleman having come into this agency. Shortly after he arrived, we had a major move. We're now in a new location, only two blocks away, which is a really wonderful thing for us and ultimately for our clients because we have a really wonderful space we hope to um, furnish. But um, I, I was talking with Aaron about some of the differences be but between what we see East and West. And the, one of the differences is that we're working with so many other organizations collaboratively with clients. Right, Aaron? That's right. Yeah. And because of that, um, we're working with a lot of other organizations that provide what we what is considered case assistance versus what we do, which is case management. It's much deeper. It goes beyond um, the typical benefits and entitlements, which I'm going to now explain a little bit more to you about. And as just yeah. to preface this, our work is in the home of our clients predominantly. We're in there often. Um, we don't really go by the city's book of what is the unit of service. It's a model we've developed over 50 years. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Aaron, did I cut you That's off? That's okay. No, not at all. I just wanted to you know, say thank everybody for letting us be here. And I think to Robin's point, Robin has a fabulous presentation here that I'm going to you know, turn it over her, to her to do. But I think that what, what makes us unique is that we don't duplicate services with some of the amazing work that's happening on the West Side already. True. We're really trying to be a collaborator. We're really trying to figure out what are the gaps? What are the holes? What are the services that are needed? And we're doing that by having all of these conversations, including with all of you. So it's really helpful to know that um, and to be thinking about us in that way. So thanks, Aaron. Take it away, Robin. I will. So <laughs> 50 years ago, a minister in a church realized that there were so many people behind the walls of their apartments 
um, really just dying for lack of service. And so as he started searching care with a grant, he and a social worker literally knocked on doors of a lot of supers saying there must be people with white hair that you wonder how they even get their mail, let alone their food. And that's how we really started with our base. And um, I credit the first social worker with realizing a lot of the needs that older people need, starting with social workers who really address issues in a holistic sense. If our social workers can't fix a problem, they'll connect you to somebody who can. Our service area, um, as you now, extends on the Upper West Side from West 60th to 110th Street. And to be honest with you, quite often, as we do on the East Side, when, we, when a partner asks us to go a little bit outside of that for special need, of course, we'll consider it. So our primary service, and we consider these doors because there are lots of different ways you can come into search and care. We're not a cookie cutter agency. So many older people have a variety of needs. We like to think that our services meet those needs. You may not need a social worker, but if you do, care management is where you start. Age 60 plus, living in our service area. Um, and I basically explained that they, they do, do go beyond the um, typical benefits and entitlements. Um, and our social workers carry a caseload of approximately, is it 40 to 50 clients, Aaron? Yeah, we try to keep the caseload smaller right? and being largely privately funded, it allows us to do that. So mm -hmm. it really is beneficial. Okay. And the probably one of the most second important services we provide is a financial service. The original social worker realized that if our mission is to help people stay in their home, you need to make sure that the landlord is kept happy. And there's lots of reasons why people need help with paying their bills. It could be a visual challenge. It could be a cognitive challenge. It could be simply denying that you owe anybody anything or the inability to open your mail. So we hire retired financial pros to go into our clients' homes. And one of the first things they do is organizational paperwork kind of things. Um, and it does involve bill paying, but it goes beyond that to um, looking at debt consolidation and reduction if need be. But ultimately, it's about returning somebody to financial stability. We always also have the ability to explore, um, to see if a client is eligible for stipends. We work with a lot of funders who have stipendiary opportunities. Each one has a different criteria. They're pretty strict, um, but that's the challenge and fun of it. Mm -hmm. And more recently, I mean, Shelly, when you and I first met, we talked about how we both differently addressed the pandemic and getting food to people. Um, we were fortunate to have some grants that allowed us to order food directly into a client's home. And we have a new grant that does the same, very same thing, which I think, as Greg will tell you now, that SNAP has been um, butchered by the government. So many people are in more, in worse shape than they have been in very, very long time. So we have a, a lot of clients who, who would need an order, as I would like to say, just in time. Another example of that might be somebody who's unfortunately just come down with COVID. They don't have the ability to go out and get food. They don't have a checkbook that they can open or credit card that they can use to order in food. That's where this comes in handy. It's a one-time order, ideally. And what that leads to is a conversation with somebody. Can we help you address your financial stability? Can we help you address your nutrition needs? It sort of feeds into other programs that we run concurrently. To hone in on that point, you know, this is designed to purchase a couple of grocery orders for an individual and in, in doing that, so meet an emergency need and in doing that, be able to engage in a bigger discussion about food insecurity and what's really happening. So it's sort of unique. And right now we're sort of sharing this with our community partners to sort of generate some referrals and to get people, you know, sort of uh, connected. And then, so, so again, meeting that initial need and then connected with our care managers and our nutritionists. So this is something that we're sharing with you and, and you know, would hope that, um, you know, more people know about it. This is a very important door to me, <laughs> being a pet owner. Um, at about 10% of our clients own pets. Most of the agencies that we collaborate with is true for them, but pets present an interesting um, challenge ultimately in a person's life. It can be a financial one. It can be a physical one when they can no longer bend down to feed the cat. 
um, but it's also so tied to the person's well-being. I think every one of our services is literally tied in a different way to a person's well-being, but no more so than pets. So we are so lucky to have funders who give us money to actually enable a client who hasn't had the ability to have their pet seen by a vet in some years to get that pet taken care of. Um, right now, interesting, Shelley, this is so exciting to me because we're actually sharing a client with a fish fish um, shelter. Um, it's somebody we've known in the community who had a tragedy, her apartment caught on fire. So she's in the shelter, but she had, her cat was found a month later. We call it the miracle cat. So with our funding, we were able to um, get that cat seen immediately by a vet. It had to go to Animal Medical Center for 24 seven IV and monitoring. And now through another collaboration, it's in a shelter, hoping we're, we're gonna hope to find a foster situation very soon. But that just gives you an idea of the importance of this program. And I wish, <laughs> it's amazing that people really want to give us money to help to help pets <laughs> and then the people. Um, but it's, it's uh, it, we're unique in this, in this particular program. Medical escorts. I don't know how many of you might've seen the article in the Times recently about a gentleman, I think a number West Sider who really tried very hard to find an escort and uh, medical escort and could not, but we're very fortunate to have this program. We modeled it after DeRotes. We pay, we recruit, train and pay people to be our part-time escorts, um, taking somebody very carefully from their home to an appointment. This is for people who don't have the luxury of a home care worker or a friend or family. And there's a lot of older adults who really do not have those benefits. So it's it's such a it's such a common storm to have somebody do this for you. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, we're seeing people really from the age of 60 to 103 needing this service for a variety of reasons. Um, it, sometimes it's a visual impediment again, or it's mobility, and sometimes it's really emotional and anxiety. So it serves a lot of needs. And for those of you that know the DIFTA programs well, the older adult centers in the Newark, you'll notice that these are all very important and I would say essential services that we're offering, and none of them are offered uh, by the traditional older adult centers in Newark, which allows us to really partner and get to know those agencies and work together to create a holistic picture that really tries to keep people at home. Uh, you know, I think that we're, we've been listening in, in a lot of these programs that have been around for a long time, and some of them that are new are really, really deliberately trying to you know, to, to fit into those gaps. This is um, an increasingly important door, um, especially since it's the third most used service to our new Upper West Side clients, Tech Coach, a free tech coach to help you address whatever issues you're having. They don't repair computers, but there's so many reasons why people come to use it to, to the digital world. And our, our focus has always been one-on-one. -on -one. For our, our age, groups are not working. They're embarrassed to ask questions. They need a lot of repetition. It's truly like learning a new language. While you might be interested in um, researching fat-free diets, somebody else may just simply want to be able to email a grandchild at college. So it, there's a big gap there. So that's why we have younger coaches. It's an intergenerational program most often teaching our clients how to participate in the digital world. And if there ever was a time to learn it, it was because of the pandemic and the need for telehealth. During the pandemic, we also developed this program. <laughs> it's, it's simply, it's what it is. It's called Talking It Out. And these are scheduled um, sessions that can be telephonic, in person, or virtual with one of our bilingual um, social workers. It's an opportunity to vent and to actually be heard. Um, it often leads somebody to a higher level of professional intervention. And in many cases, um, it's actually used in conjunction with professional psychiatry. We get a lot of referrals from um, clinics and hospitals for this particular service. Um, this door is actually one of the more fun doors, and, <laughs> and we have a lot of our Upper West Side clients engaging in groups, which have gone through a lot of transitions where they used to be in person pre-pandemic, they became telephonic specifically, more recently hybrid Zoom and telephonic, and now we're starting to bring them back in person. 
where our clients are telling us they're they're oh, they're done with the they're done with COVID. They'll wear ma- they'll wear masks, but they want to be seen and they want to be heard. So they range from meditation to medication education with our ge- our local geriatric uh, pharmacist. She's wonderful. We have pet workshops, of course. We have music. We have Spanish language specific groups. One of our more popular groups is decluttering, and I think the person who runs it is so clever. It's got, it's got a seasonal um, theme to it every time they meet and they go from room to room. So that's kind of a cool thing to do. Um, and um, this is the most, one of the more interesting new um, groups that we have at Search and Care. It addresses cognitive challenges. And um, it was developed by an organization in Virginia called Goodwin House, which is a hybrid of, of senior housing and programming. And it's about it's a program that requires the individual to do three different kinds of exercises on a daily basis. You spend 15 minutes with each. One of it is very simple math equations. One of it is a writing uh, exercise. And the third is a reading out loud exercise. And um, once a week, our participants meet with a coach virtually, and they get to talk about their mutual challenges and how they're doing. And it's great peer-to-peer support. Um, that's a really interesting group, and it meets. It runs for twelve weeks. Once a group ends, a new one starts. And I just want to let you know that um, while this is not a service directly to our clients, I think one of the most important ways we can serve uh, we can serve our city's older adults is to advocate with and for them. My colleague, Joey DiBenedetto, one of our social workers is advocating for fair pay for home care because we've had so many clients whose home care was interrupted during the pandemic because of lack of pay. And he and one of our clients who's in the middle picture, they've been to Albany and back. You can see them with your local assembly member here. They've also been to city hall. So we are advocates as well as providers. And that's what we want, came here to talk to you about tonight, how we help people, regardless of where they live, um, to help with them stay as to remain as New Yorkers, which I think is a, is a great, ultimate, at the end of the day, a great thing to help people do. Wow. Wow. <laughs> All those door, wonderful doors. Yes. <laughs> a lot of doors. <laughs> and I know a lot of people who would be very good potential uh, people being serviced. Uh, I knew some of the services, but uh, this has been an eye opener for me. Thank you for I, the for the opportunity. Yes. No, it's so important that pe- people don't know. They say so many people say, "Well, I have the situation." The escort. Who's going to take this person to the doctor's appointment? They're not going to be able to make it, or to this or that. And I get texts all the time from people do you know anybody and and we spend all day trying to find you know find the person in the community who may be available it's a service and and all the other services are invaluable i want to introduce uh three uh board members who are not on the committee but are active with the committee and i have to start with madge rosenberg who form a chair okay and member uh kay carpin uh, who is not only the board, but he's also uh, the um, spiritual leader of St. Paul and St. Andrew and, and an inspiration for us. And Doug Kleiman, our vice chair of the board, who always takes an interest in what we're doing and values it, and we value him. So in addition to our, our committee members, um, it would be helpful to have a, um, a copy of the um, PowerPoint so we can Absolutely. make sure we don't include, you know, don't exclude anything that's important. And um, mm-hmm. although people may not realize all the home um, based stuff and stuff that's done is fee free. Yes. Okay? Is. In other words, no one has to pay for these services. Uh, and it's pr- largely privately fund- funded. People give. We are ninety percent privately funded. That's and right. we, but I think as a part of our district needs, recognizing these needs, which I think everyone would agree are the needs in our community, uh, to 
be able to get some funding from the city council through our our um, expense budget priorities. Yeah. So uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, within the next couple of months, we're going to be putting together our district needs statement and our recommendations. And um, I'm, I, I see from the looks of our members that uh, they'll be very glad to make this a priority and promote it. So th thank you so much. Uh, thank you so I, much for having us. Okay, I thought Great I knew a lot, I, I learned more. Thank you. Yeah, and I just wanna say, you know, being relatively new to the West Side, we really appreciate the support. We appreciate being here and we, we will share all of this information. Please pass it along. And if there are providers that you think that we should get to know and meet on the West Side, please connect us there. Uh, because we want to meet everybody. And okay, and thank you again. Okay, I, in closing, I so just much. want to remind you that um, Aaron and I are active members of Roberta Seamer's CB7 Task Force. So I have the luxury of having met Reverend Kay and Madge previously, mm -hmm. and um, I'm actually been tapped to work on a project with her of having um, Upper West Side organize, um, organizations do a virtual roundtable of everything we offer so that people get to know who we are and mm -hmm. what's available Great. to them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there much. a question? Yeah. Any, are there any questions? Uh, I see Ken. Ken yeah. Coughlin. Yeah, Please. Um, yeah, this is new to me, so I'm really glad to hear about it. Um, I guess I, I had two questions. What's the, um, is there an income threshold um, for, uh, um, there is not. There, nope. None? Okay. There is not. Okay. Wonderful. And um, uh, um, how oh how large a population do you serve? I know you said that each social worker has about fifty or sixty in their caseload, but well, and, we're we're still new to the Upper West Side, so currently our caseload is approximately two hundred older the adults. Upper West, upper West Side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, but we're and, we're happy to grow that. That's why yeah, one of the reasons why we're here tonight. Do you, yeah. do you have any sense of how that compares to the need? I think we're just starting to tap it. I think that what we're finding out is that the need is a lot greater than what we're able to do at this moment. And I think that, you know, we are very inclined to, to try to meet that need and to keep building on our work on the West side. I think that it's every time we meet new people and we meet new uh, partners, we find new referrals. We're finding that, you know, the things that we're offering, you know, are the right things. So, you know, on the east side, our, our caseloads are much bigger because we've been there for so long. And now we're on the west side and it's really, you know, trying to get to know what the unique needs are so that we can tailor them effectively. Um, but so far, you know, that everything that we're offering that we've just presented is, is, uh, has come up. Okay. My, my uh, co-chair, Sonia uh, Garcia, and then Doug Kleinman. That was a really great presentation. I, wow. I, I mean, there were so many questions that I had. And, you know, um, you said you're 90% private funding. And, and how difficult has that been? Do you do it through grants? I, I mean, I don't know if these are appropriate questions. <laughs> Absolutely appropriate. Yeah. A Aaron. It's a constant challenge. Sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's, we have a lot of um, grant support. We, we have a wonderful relationships with a lot of, you know, foundations and grants. We also have, um, you know, several fundraisers all year and we have, you know, private donors and, you know, that's, but it's, it's constant. Yes. And, and in order to sort of to build on it and to keep going, you know, sort of year to year, um, it does take, um, you know, a lot of outreach. Now, you're on 94th and what? And what avenues? 94th and 3rd. Between 2nd yeah. and 3rd. Between 2nd and 3rd. We just moved, yeah. Huh? Oh, you just moved? <laughs> we just moved around the corner. We moved in May 3rd. <laughs> <laughs> we were on 2nd uh, um, Avenue and between 95th and 96th and just moved, you know, two blocks away. Oh, okay. 17 years. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. 20 years, okay. I think. Right? I, I, I go to a, a restaurant over by you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Stop in and say hello. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe okay. So that's, that's, to. Yes. Now, do you come to the? How do if since we're on the west side, how mm -hmm. would our how would our population go to? Well, we come to you. We have you know we have a designated team of of social workers that work on the west side, 
and they have gotten pretty strategic about doing their home visit back to back and okay. doing their West oh, Side. So home visits. Yeah, that makes so, sense. Yeah, and then a lot of it is done remotely. You know, a lot of it can oh. be done on on video or over the phone, and okay. we like to do a home visit. You know, if it, and it, we do find that important, and and we say homebound in the loosest sense of the word. Um, you know, we, we specialize in folks that are you know mobility limited, but um, people can come to us too if they'd rather. Thank you. That's so uh, really it's very exciting. My goodness! Wow. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Yeah. Doug. Yeah, I, I just uh, in an expression of uh, gratitude, and and um, I don't wish to make this about me, but I'm an only child, and I take care of my mom. My dad passed away about a year and a half ago, so. Mm -hmm. I was going through the list of services and, and jotting them down. And I realized yeah, I do that and that and that and, that, and I'm the care manager. You do that and, and you do and, that. And, and, and mm -hmm. thank God that I'm, I'm able to do it. But it, right. I always, it keeps me up at night to think if I can't, if I have to go somewhere, if I fall sick or whatever, what, what, what would happen? And then of course, you know, the neighbors and people in our community who I am certain, uh, you know, many will need these services need to know about it. So I'm so glad you're here and we can, spread the word. I was wondering if you do direct referrals from some of the organizations, like you mentioned, like DeRoe, or Goddard, or, or SPOP. Do you know SPOP? We do. Yes. Yeah. Do, do you work in, you know, complement in conjunction with them? All of them. Yep. Great. All Increasingly, we present to their teams. We try to get our teams together so that the social workers can meet each other, know each other, and make those referrals seamless. Um, but yes, we've done a lot of um, conversations and back and forth referrals with with all those agencies you mentioned amazing mm -hmm. amazing okay. thank you thank, thank you, you too thank you thank you okay again we're so appreciative of your work and and that you shared the information with us so we can have it and share it with uh, our community you know far and wide i think it's invaluable some of these services and so needed our so doors thank are you so open much. thank you Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Good to meet you. Okay. Ne next in line, uh, number one district need food insecurity, okay, every year. And, and why? Because th the problem is real. And for those who th thought it was less um, serious during the pandemic, we found clearly that there were huge numbers of people who not only needed access to food and nutritious food at that time, but needed it all along. And it was just the programs that came out um, with COVID uh, that enabled them to get access. And then having actually uh, gone to people's homes and realized that and, and heard about people, some people who we thought were middle class doing well, who was struggling on fixed incomes, who not only one case, husband was seriously ill, but at home, um, on fixed income, these were people who always gave to charity generously, and three home aides, eight hours each, who had to be fed also by the host. So there were five people who needed to be fed three meals a day, uh, three meals a day across the three. And um, that's just one example of so many. Uh, West Side campaign against hunger is very dear to my heart because when we had the area policy board, when uh, West Side campaign against hunger came to us, I think we were the first funders, okay, in, in getting it started. But it has been a uh, life source for our community, so many in our community, and and really citywide uh, in, in terms of the service and also coordination of their work with other agencies. And we're blessed to have Greg Silverman, the CEO and Executive Director of Westside Campaign Against Hunger with us this evening, and take it away. Sure. And... Uh... Thank you for having me here tonight. And a uh, shout out to uh, Aaron and Rebecca. It was nice to hear more about search and care. Aaron came over the uh, the other week, my fellow my fellow Central New Yorker from New York Mills, and I'm from Utica. So it's we're 
we'll we'll do we'll we'll do more together. So it's great to hear about what you guys are doing. Uh, and to their point on ninety percent, I have to say on the ninety percent private, it's like it's nice to hear that, but it's it's horrific in some way. Like they're never gonna, none of us are ever gonna be able to meet the need, right? Like charity is never gonna solve these issues on its own. Like the issues are too vast and that's why we need public sector support and public sector advocacy. As, the, just, as, as I'll walk you through uh, the, our PowerPoint slide, like the needs are growing and the support is, is not, especially from the public sector. So uh, I don't know if you're pulling it up or am I pulling it up? Does it matter, Alex? It's up to you. Would you prefer to pull it up or would you like me to? Uh, I can, I think, pull it up. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing the slides now? Yep, clear. Great, so I'll just give a little background and go into where we're at right now, what's going on in the future, and you know, obviously to take any questions, but uh, you know, just right, level setting, right? Uh, things weren't good before the pandemic, uh, but things have gotten worse since then, right? We're seeing numbers like we've never seen before, uh, more children who are hungry. In truth, the pandemic was actually a boon for fighting hunger, right? In some ways, we finally got the public sector support we needed. We proved models, right? The, like, the public sector actually gave the supports necessary to lift people up out of food insecurity. Rates went down. And what did we do with that? We got rid of the programs, right? Because why, why would we continue smart, smart policy? Uh, so, Right, we're seeing obviously folks from minority groups are experiencing it twice as high as from you know white New Yorkers, folks black and Hispanic New Yorkers, uh, and just the numbers just continue to grow. And you know the the stat thinking about search and care, you know a thirty percent increase for people aged sixty five and older in one year in food insufficiency, like that's a horrific stat. Like these folks aren't going back to work ever. Right, that's just not going to be the case. These folks are not going to be running around the city to to go to every pantry to to get the food they need. They need more bespoke support. Uh, you know, we we found right, like the the fact of the matter is right. SNAP helps, but it doesn't get you through the month. Right, and that that is where emergency food providers come in. Uh, just to be clear, like organizations like the West Side Campaign Against Hunger do not provide 30 days of food. We provide about five days of food for each of our customers uh, who come and get food from us. We've been around for over 40 years in this emergency feeding sector. Uh, as our mission says, right, trying to ensure that all New Yorkers have access with dignity to a choice of healthy food and supportive services. We wanna give people the best food possible. We actually don't think giving out inferior, high caloric, ultra processed food does anything positive. And so we, we're we never gonna turn a blind eye to uh, giving out bad product because our customers deserve the best. Every New Yorker deserves the best. We wanna make that happen. Uh, but we're not happy, right? Like 40 years in the emergency feeding sector, there's no such thing as a 40 year emergency, right? Emergencies last weeks, maybe months, Maybe once in a while you have a pandemic and you and you you that emergency lasted a bit longer, but 40 year emergency is not an emergency. It's an abject failure in public policy. And, and so we have to do more. And as you can see, start out with 20,000, you know, we were in the last five years, three years, gone from 20,000 customers to serving about 75,000 customers every year. Uh, and so just really that has grown drastically. As you can see in this, in the last year, we have a July to June financial year, reached about 75,000 individuals, uh, about $4 million worth of benefits enrollment in SNAP. So we're really focused that every customer we service for food is also getting screened for benefits. And we wanna sign people up for the most impactful benefits, health insurance, housing, uh, SNAP obviously number one, when, when people are eligible. Uh, 
We have about 60, at the height of the pandemic, about 60 partner sites across the entire city uh, where we're distributing food. So we're definitely, we did a little bit of work in Staten Island. I wouldn't, I mean, we have customers from Staten Island, but we're very focused on Upper West Side, Harlem, Washington Heights, Inwood, all the way up going north uh, and into the South Bronx has been where sort of we've been serving for, for decades. Uh, and you can see in the diagram that ratio, which is really important to us, all the food poundage and the blue lower part is the fresh produce, right? We're, we, at the heart of the pandemic, we're giving out 52, 55% fresh produce. If you went back six years, the amount of fresh produce we give out now is more than the total amount of food we gave out six years ago. Uh, there, there is no organization. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that we're, we're great. I'm saying we're actually doing what's adequate. Like there is no organization in the country that gives out at this level over 50%, probably over 25% fresh produce. And we just think it's what it's supposed to be. Not, you know, we're not special because of that. We're supposed to be, we're what the norm should be. Uh, and, and we also, you know, we've always been focused on this idea of dignity and choice. And a long time ago, you know, this is, Wiska came, created the first customer choice pantry as many people uh, speak to, you know, almost three decades ago. But what we realized in the pandemic uh, is choice and dignity isn't just about kale versus collards, carrots versus, you know, clementines. It's actually about how we value and engage with people related to their time, uh, related to how they want to use their resources. And so our distribution model by working in partnership and community has allowed, you know, for a long time, customers came from all over the city to the Upper West Side to get food. And in truth, that was horrific, right? Why should people travel from the South Bronx, from, you know, Bed-Stuy to 86th Street? It's a long journey. We want to be at 86th Street, serve customers from a smaller area, better service to people on the Upper West Side in, you know, Lower Harlem, uh, so that they don't have to travel much. And if they want to come get food in person, that's great. So we built sites around the city uh, where we distribute with community partner sites, New York Presbyterian hospital sites, you know, HIV groups, settlement houses. Uh, and we've done, and what we're showing in this picture here is our latest project, which is, uh, this is the first cohort of over 300 customers who are getting delivery to their homes every other week, our groceries. Uh, it's They're ordering via text, their customized boxes of food, whether they want alternative dairy, whether they want a mix of fresh and canned produce, whether they want only fresh produce, whether they're vegetarian, we can customize the boxes, we can set the order with them and then they can set it and forget it. And we can send follow-ups just like when someone's ordering food online, we can sort of help them get food that way. And so we're we're really in this testing at this out with getting customers who traveled far away to not have to do that, especially, you know, moms with young kids and elderly adults. So we're building this with New York Presbyterian and slowly growing it. And it, we, we see this as the future, right? We want to bring people food where they live or in their community. We don't think forcing people to travel to a, a free or priced grocery store, and that's what Wiska 86th Street was, is, is, the, is the future, right? The future is that people want customer service, and part of that means control of their time. You know, our, our goal is that a customer says, you want to come to 86th Street? Great. You want to go into your neighborhood to get food? Great. You want to have it delivered to your home? Great. You choose. And, and that's where we want to be, is just giving people the choice. Uh, and so that's, you know, on an individual direct service level, that's what we've been focused on, obviously ramping that up uh, in big ways in the last few years. At the same time, and, you know, it's what some folks know a bit less about, uh, Wiska founded what's called the Roundtable. So it's, it's a collect, it started out as a collective purchase group, uh, where the eight organizations you see on the screen, all frontline emergency food providers work together to drive down prices and increase the product that we're getting, the better quality product. So, you know, we purchase together these eight organizations, for example, tractor trailer loads of oats, 
shelf stable milk. Uh, we strong arm food purveyors and say, if you don't give us each the same price, you will lose all eight contracts. So doing things that, you know, I come from the restaurant world as a chef and restaurant owner, like this is what you do to make sure you get the best product for your customers. My customers, my restaurant are no more important than the customers, the 75,000 customers we serve for free uh, in across New York City. And so what we do together and part of this is, and this is where the policy piece comes in, the voice of WISCA is strong, but the voice of these eight folks groups together is much stronger. So last year, for two years, we've been advocating to change the emergency feeding assistance program, which is now called Community Food Connections Program. You know, it was a $22 million program. It's grown since then where emergency food providers would get food. The dirty secret was all that food was shelf stable. You couldn't get fresh produce. We changed the RFP. I literally wrote the sentence for the mayor's office of food policy, where we put in the sentence as like uh, forcing a choice of fresh produce. We're not demanding every pantry serve fresh produce like Wiska does, but they should have a choice where their dollars get spent. And so that led to a change in who runs that program, right? Formerly the food bank ran that EFAP program, and now it's a for-profit who's focused on fresh produce. We're all getting the product we want now. And we did that by working collectively because no one's solving hunger on their own, right? It's just, it's it hasn't happened and it's not going to happen. You're seeing, you're going to hear from us in the coming days across the city and across the state because the eight members you see here, four of us each lost the biggest state contract that exists for anti-hunger work. The HIPNAP program, uh, where WISCA was awarded $375,000 a year for the next five years, and we've been getting it for a few decades, two decades, uh, we, we got that contract, and so did uh, Campaign Against Hunger, and so did Holy Apostles and Met Council. But for the first time in a decade, New York Common Pantry, POTS, Project Hospitality, and St. John's Bread and Life all lost this contract, which means they normally have $375,000 a year that goes towards food only, mostly. And so they've just lost that much money in food purchasing ability uh, because of a battle between the state legislature and the governor's office. And so we have two weeks to sort of get that money put back in so these organizations get the funds they need because it's not helpful if WISCA gets this money and, and Common Pantry on the east side of Manhattan doesn't, right? We all need this, these funds. And all these half these groups lost a half million dollars in nourish funding from the state as well in the last two weeks. Like so, there's a lot of cuts happening that are really for food. And so we we know and we're reaching out with a network across the entire state to advocate on these issues because we have to do it. And we have to do it together because we're just so much stronger as a collective voice. But you know, if you look at it right, like these eight organizations, right, 650 distribution points across New York City. We, we, are, we are a powerful set of players who work together. And that's the key for us is we just want to work together and get more groups in this with us on the front line. Uh, as many of you know, in the neighborhood, you know, we've been at the Church of St. Paul's and St. Andrews for our entire history. Uh, and it's an amazing church, amazing space for community. You know, it's not blowing smoke with you know Kay here. Like he, we all know, we all know the power of SPSA and and being a part of it. Uh, but it's not supposed to be a, a warehouse. <laughs> it wasn't designed for warehousing eighty thousand pounds of food going into a basement every week. Uh, and so you know, we we're not we're never leaving Eighty Sixth Street as 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 far as long as I'm around. Uh, but we also know at the same time. And we wanted to make sure people see this, that we're, we're building a new warehouse. Uh, we're not leaving 86th Street, but the warehousing side of things is going to move to 180th Street in Washington Heights, former U.S. post office distribution facility. So we'll have some offices up there. Uh, but 86th Street will be able to do what it does best, right? Distribute food to community members in need, engage the community in activism and giving back and just being a great community space, as opposed to you know, in a very, uh, not the safest manner, right? Like bringing 
all these carts up and down this building. Like where, you know, Kay could let you know about the bumps and bruises that staff, volunteers, and the building have have felt over over the years. And so uh, we're we're excited for this process. I just I, I throw a slide up here just to seem to be stuck. You know, so this is a space that I just put it up there so people see it at different times. It has internal docks. Trucks will be at a back end. We can unload trucks with forklifts. The key for us, the upper right corner, is is a walk-in cooler that will hold 50 pallets of a pallets about 2,000 pounds. So 50 pallets of fresh produce, right? We can hold about three pallets right now. So that ability to sort of bring food in and out and across the city is going to change drastically for us. And so that that's really, you know, a key for us. I always put this up for everyone, right? Like we're always looking for folks to help out. Uh, we can, I can make it happen personally, but we do it with New York Cares. We have folks packing food, like 35 to 45 people every day, uh, volunteers, customers, you know, people who need our food, people who are big financial supporters, elected officials, everywhere in between, you know, coming, handing out food, setting up distribution outside, packing bags. We'll have uh, on May 21st, we did this last year, we're going to do it again. We're going to close off 86th Street between West End and Riverside Drive. And hopefully about a thousand volunteers will show up and we are going to pack all day long food for people in need. It's just a good Sunday afternoon uh, with beautiful weather, of course. We, we, we're, we're hoping for that. Uh, and just get the community back together. It's just one of the ways as we've grown, we know we can't just be having the old, like we used to dinners in the basement, right? It just doesn't hold enough people. Uh, so having like an opportunity for lots of folks to come together is, is really important to us. Uh, and we're just starting to have some Sunday and Saturday and Sunday events as well for folks who want to bring their kids as well. Just trying to find more ways to get people pre-pandemic how we used to be able to bring a lot more volunteers in. So I leave that up there just so people see it. Uh, and, you know, there's just a picture of us in the warehouse. There's the team. Uh, we're a lot more branded than we used to be because it's also for safety reasons. But this is us in our new little warehouse and uh, happy to answer any questions. I didn't pull up the question and answers, but uh, yeah, I'll pause there. Wow, <laughs> thank you. Um, are we gonna get out of this location? Okay. I can stop sharing. Uh, you're, you're such a sharing person that it was hard to get out of sharing. I, I have a 22 year old grandson who is free for the first time for a month in June. He said, can I do something active to help the community? Yeah, yeah. Who should he contact? Uh, you, can, you can contact me and I'll put him in touch with Stephen Yee. He's our volunteer. Terrific. Great. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a hard worker and a dedicated the, you know, that yeah, he does. Yeah, sometimes folks really like unloading trucks. It's a good physical workout as well. Yeah, yeah. Lose your gym membership and uh, uh -huh. unload trucks every day. Terrific. Okay. Any, any questions? Uh, uh, my question is how do you do what you do? <laughs> I mean, we have, we have, right, we have a great, we have a staff of 30 uh, who are amazing through and through throughout the entire pandemic, you know you don't do it without lots of volunteers and you know amazing customers and who care about food and want to be a part of it and are so appreciative it really pushes our entire team on i think every day and and as well like we have been so lucky to have a support base on the upper west side you know volunteers donors elected officials right like you know, like, you know I, I came into wisca uh when helen rosenthal was our council member uh and had worked with Gail Brewer in another nonprofit. And it was like, you know, I'm not comparing either two, but like, you know, you know, WISC is just so lucky to have amazing elected officials uh, who want to support this work. And now Mark Levine being borough president, he's been a big supporter. So we have, we have, you know, lots of folks, you know, Linda Rosenthal and Robert yeah. Jackson. Uh, uh, we're just, mm -hmm. we're just, we're just blessed. And, Great. And blessed. Okay. Uh, Co-chair Sonia Garcia. 
Um, thank you for that presentation, um, Greg. Can you tell me, is there a, um, a, an income requirement to get food in, at your place? No, we've never had an income requirement. I mean- So people just go? People go and we, we do a screening, you know, we want to, we do an intake, right? We want to get information for them, okay. not for an income requirement, but to be able to see what other benefits people need. I see. I'd say like as a, as a, as a chef restaurant owner background, like it's kind of like the food, although it's, it's like the amuse bouche at a high-end restaurant. The main <laughs> focus is the benefits, right? But people don't know that they might not, they, that they're eligible for these benefits. And so we have to like go through that with customers. I mean, right now, I see. We're not doing as, you know, the, we're having a lot more customers who are not eligible. Uh, I mean, a, as you see, like on a Monday at uh, SPSA, all the effort that's happening with the migrant issues, migrant crisis, right? Like we have more and more customers coming to us who uh, want food. You know, we're, we, you know, we're not asking them, you know, are you at a shelter that's allowing cooking? Like that's not our, it's not our responsibility. Like you want food and you want to cook it somehow? Great. Like, because we don't actually do, pre-prepared meals right but uh we're just seeing you know i think our i think last two months is a hundred percent busier than last year this months same wow. time which was the busiest on record because that was high in the pandemic right right now is just like we've never nothing we've ever seen before and huh. it's sort of like we i feel like an idiot saying it. it's like this is what people are like he said this last year like it's never been this busy before i'm like it sadly it just keeps getting worse but we're lucky to have an amazing community of supporters that allow us to keep pushing out amazing food to people. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doug. Yeah, again, wow, uh, for part two of, of the, tonight's meeting. Um, so I was really saddened uh, to hear about the loss of funding for your, for your collaborators. And so I have sort of two, two questions. One is, um, you mentioned our beloved elected officials. Uh, is there anything that this community board can do to advocate? And I'm sure Shelley's nodding his head. I'm sure you've already thought about that. Um, but, you know, that's just horrifying to me. And I, you mentioned all, you know, most of our elected officials. Um, and then there's Brad Hoyleman Siegel as well. Yeah, meeting with him Thursday, I think. Great. So I don't, is there anything that we can do to, you know, you know, squeaky wheels and rattle? Yeah. Uh, and then the second part of that que second question is, do any major food distributors, grocery stores, manufacturers, farms, do they participate? And I'm thinking of, you know, the Whole Foods and Amazon and, and Kroger's and Wegmans and Trader Joe's and, and then the actual manufacturers of the food. Do, do these people participate, donate, contribute? Yeah. So on the first part, uh, yes to the squeaky wheel. I mean, I think at a city level, due to the state cuts that are happening, I think the city's going to be asked. Like we already reached out to the mayor's office of food policy, but letting elected officials know, like uh, emergency, like anti-hunger work across the city is getting cuts from the state. So there's going to be cutbacks in programming, and whether the city wants to argue from the mayor's office with the with the governor. Sorry, I have two little kids in the background if, you, if you're hearing that. Uh, or, and also there might be an emergency allocation that's gonna have to happen at a city level. Uh, we're just continuing to need the emergency feeding the community food connections program. It might, you know, can they get another allot, you know, allotment of food to some of the organizations who didn't get the funding? And then at the state, you know, the state elected officials, I, I was thinking that you guys all focus more on the city officials or, but at a state, the state level it, right now, the HIPNET program is a $55 million program. The governor only funded it for, I think, roughly 33 million, sort of throwing two million, 22 million back at the state legislature saying, you put it back in the budget, so it's not all on me. So what happened is the organizations that didn't get funded, it was because they constricted the amount of the, or the total money. So in the next couple of weeks, the budget's going to get finalized. So this is the time to contact elected officials and say, you need to fully fund HIPNAP uh, to all elected officials. And so it's telling your state assembly and state senators that they need to push on this. We're going to be sending stuff out across the WISCA network. Uh, 
but but this is the time right now in the next two weeks. And that is, it's right, it's in some ways, just to be clear, it's not gonna get WISCA another penny from the state. It's gonna get lots of other great organizations the money they need and not just in the city. Like I've been, I was on calls with folks in Albany and Southern tier. There's just these cuts across the entire state and it all has a ripple effect, right? Uh, so so it, yeah, now is the time and, and we'll be sending this out uh, probably in the coming days some of these letters. So we'll, we'll make sure people, I'll it, send it through to Shelly as well. On the second question, you know, this is where City Harvest it, it functions most importantly in New York City. So when Trader Joe, you know, they pick up at Trader Joe's on the Upper West Side and literally the truck doesn't even go to a warehouse. It just comes up the street to 86th Street and they drop it off to us. So retail, food rescue is where City Harvest, you know, really, is important for the emergency feeding sector across New York City. Mm -hmm. So we don't do that much ourselves with grocers. Uh, we do go to Hunts Point, right? And we pick up directly from uh, big food wholesalers. And these are some of the groups who actually distribute to the other distributors, right? So, you know, we get food through grants from Ace Endico, Driscoll and groups like that, but the groups who sell to them are in Hunts Point. And so, uh, Dirigio, Dirigo, uh, Katzman, A and J, groups you probably haven't heard much about. I mean, but this is who feeds New York City, right? Uh, they they give us large quantities of free food, and then they also will sell to us at a, an incredibly low rates. Actually, in the last two months, we've been getting food forty percent cheaper than we'd normally pay for wholesale. So, uh, yeah. But manufacturing, I think you got to be a bigger player. You know, not that Whisk is small, but having done more of this work in a national level, you know, they're going to make deals. Manufacturers might be making deals with uh, food banks or city harvest of the world. And we're, we'll see that food. We'll get it. But we're not the ones. Who, and we, we wouldn't know who that is. Thank you. Thank you. And Jim, and sorry, I, I see Ken's hand up. Just, so if, if there was a local supermarket that wanted to come to the Upper West Side that was worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars or, and, you know, or, or existing supermarkets that are expanding within this neighborhood. Um, are these partners that you would appreciate going direct or, or is it really, does City Harvest is really the better channel? I mean, we would love to build relationships directly, right? That like, that would be, because. Yeah, I mean, and I assume they get a tax benefit for donating, right? I mean, yeah, and you know, bigger than the tax benefit for a lot of these groups is the savings in, you know, trash, trash, right? If you're, if you're, you know, you got food that's going to waste, and it's not that it's bad; it's that a customer doesn't want to buy it at the grocery store because it's they're like, yeah, it's too ripe, it's perfect, mm -hmm. it's only going to last for two days. Those strawberries at home, they need, they're going to toss it. And that costs money to toss it. So yeah. you know, we're, like, oh we, we're cheaper than trash. <laughs> okay, for sure. Uh, but I like the idea that these are some big, there's also groups like uh, Compassion Coalition, there's groups out of, uh, uh, actually, uh, maybe Aaron out of Utica who are oh, bargain grocery opening, looking to open up in New York. Uh, very, very, you know, sub low cost, grocery store like they have in Utica and they're doing one in Albany. And th this is a big player who sort of can upset the apple cart of some of the stuff in a positive way. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I think, I think Shelly understands the, the line of my question. I work in commercial real estate and we interface with some of the, those companies. You never side. know. And, it, and it's good uh, PR for them. Yeah, we support the work of the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Okay, uh, Ken Coglin. Yeah, uh, well, usually, um, you know, we we have to wait a month. Um, you know, when somebody says oh, we need help in two weeks, um, you know, that's kind of short, too short for us for a resolution. But fortuitously, we come at the end of the month, and next week uh, we have a full board meeting. Um, so we could pass a resolution uh, to, let's say, fully fund um, 55 million. Um, what was it, HIPNAP? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you over like the draft 
I'll send to Shelly the draft of the like the outreach letter we're using, and you can pull pull information from it any way you want. But it has the numbers and everything. So it, okay, I don't know, Shelly. What, what do you think? So well, um, I think we can do two things. We can issue a letter to all the elected officials and all the important people. So just if I have agreement from the committee members, which I know I do, and from the board members, and we can publicize it there. If we try doing a resolution, it may uh, get one get lost in the mix, with, which is what I'm gonna talk about for a minute after our presentation, and uh, may be objected to that it wasn't done in the right way and so on. So I think taking action through a uh, committee uh, letter, letter from the board supporting this um, would be more effective. And that's what the result would be of a resolution that we appeal to the, these elected officials. So if we can do it directly and make it known in our, in our uh, when our committee is, um, is presenting, okay, for a minute to, to um, inform everybody of the situation, I think it'll be more effective. But I appreciate you, what you want to do. And I think, I think it'll be more effective that way and, mm -hmm. and less cumbersome. Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, Shelly, you got a couple of questions in the q and I just wanted to make sure you oh. that relate to. Uh, Great. Okay. Let's see. Um, here. The tech help is extremely helpful for the elderly. That was from before our community. However, tech help is often needed immediately as opposed to on an appoint appointment basis. How is the tech help being provided right when clients need it? That would be for um, search and care. Yeah. Okay. We have a very active staff, a combination of coaches and part-time coaches and volunteers make an appointment, call us and make an appointment. We'd be happy to help you. Number is 212-289-5300, Monday to Friday, nine to five. Okay. And uh, someone who had had their hand up, I don't see that those hands, so I don't know, but it said, wh what percentage of search and care clients are people of color? Robin, do you have those? I, I honestly don't know that. I'm so sorry. I don't know it by um, race, but I can tell you that more than 65% of our clients are at or below federal poverty level. Uh, that's not the same question, but it certainly is meaningful to us. Hmm? Yeah, we can share that information too. I don't want to give you the wrong numbers. Okay. Um, appreciate your support of... Okay, that's something on the safe haven, which we'll mention in a minute. Uh, you brought up a great point uh, point uh, uh, of people oftentimes out knowing that they are eligible for these, they do not know they're eligible for these programs. What efforts are being put in place to accurately uh, inform them? So uh, it's it's the public relations thing. One thing we did was having this here tonight, and also we're going to be publicizing it through our district needs. But what happens to get to the people is hard. Perhaps we could put some information on our website. You know, older adults need assistance or uh, uh, exp um, uh, having difficulty with food uh, insufficiency and have, you know, call or do, that may be a way to go. Okay. I, I think that is one of the issues in general, you know, when people call and say, uh, what, what should I do about this? You know, there's no place to go or I call three agencies and they say, I don't exactly do that. Okay. And it becomes problematic. And the fact that both Wiska and Search and Care are collaborating with others uh, 
the answers may be there even if your agency doesn't do it directly. So I think that type of information sharing, it'd be great because I think I get 50 calls a week because, oh, uh, Gail Brewer says, speak to Shelley. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's been, a, my wife doesn't appreciate it all the time. I'm glad you get those calls too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that Gail's office puts out a resource for older oh, adults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think and she puts does. out, you know, uh, updates every week. All the elected mm -hmm. officials do. I think um, maybe getting the information from your organizations to her, like re repeat weekly, uh, may be a way to go. I'm sure she wouldn't object. But I think a lot of people isn't there, and and the others. Okay, there's no reason why not. It may save them having to answer a lot of calls. So maybe in their interest, doubly. Okay. So I am going. Okay, pass the resolution. Okay, the funds. Okay. Uh, okay. We our committee will be putting together our district needs. We already have information from both agencies about what specifically they'd like us to advocate for. And what, that's the way we're going to do it. The reason we have these agencies on now, always relevant, is because by June, we're going to have our contribution to district needs. And as I said in the opening, we, we get a lot high priority for what we need, which I think reflects the community board's uh, concern with health and human services. And, um, and the needs of people in the community. So uh, as a, uh, a couple of women came out on a Friday night of a facility in the community on 98th, 98th and 99th, I had my hood on, it was freezing cold. I had my young grandson with me and at a, I didn't know how they even recognize him. Oh, Mr. Fine, your committee is the one that takes care of us. And I was in shock. Number one, that they recognized me with my hood on and all bundled up. But two, that they, they knew about the committee as being where the place to go to, to have their needs addressed. The ones, the people who are most vulnerable and those who didn't have representation of their own. And so uh, we're gonna uh, push for what the people need, and uh, your organizations do a lot to, you know, to to get that to the people. And we want not only to publicize it, but to help with the necessary funding to the extent that we can. And we appreciate very much that you could join us this evening. And um, a pleasure, onward and upward, okay. working together. Thank you all so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Let us know what else you need. Thank you. Thanks, okay. everyone. Yep. Bye, bye. Okay. bye bye. Okay, and we're going to just hang in for a minute. As someone said uh, uh, something, appreciate your support of the West 83rd Street Safe Haven. Will the committee push back against the language? Blah 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 blah. So I just want to say, in a very simple way, um, that I met with our chair Beverly this week, and we. Um, modified the language so it's clearly in support of the safe haven, not subject to anything, but with the expectation of some reductions and things like that. And we, we kept the things that other people had requested like cubicles, but I said, we don't tell agencies how to do their work. But if you want to include cubicles, say, uh, under, uh, if, if advised by, the, by breaking ground, you know, that, that it would be desirable. And we took into consideration uh, the safety issues, although given the history, we've never had a safety issue across from a school. But since people are concerned, we want all the agencies and police and everybody working together to address it. And in the future, that the uh, DHS should take into consideration the fact of proximity to schools, which is not saying that you can't do it, but saying that 
it's something that she considered because people are concerned about it. So I think we've come to a, um, a peaceful and constructive solution. Uh, and uh, that will be, I, I believe, the board will be informed shortly of that. So, so Kay, go ahead and then Ken. Yeah, I guess um, I wasn't quite sure. It seemed a little gratuitous, the comment about future siting and schools. It just, I think the, and, and maybe that's, you know, a, a function of, you know, all the, all the comments from the community that were around that. But I think it, it's, it reinforces this false narrative that homeless people, you know, are statistically some, you know, a threat to, um, to kids and, and, and to schools. And I, I don't, you know, I, it's just unfortunate because it's just, it has no basis. In fact, from anything I can discern. Well, um, if I could just say two things, one, yeah. 130 uh, men shelter was there without a complaint for 10 years. Okay. And on 108th street, for the past 35 years, there was Valley Lodge. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ira Michnik uh, pointed out that he was PA president of, uh, of, of Booker T, okay? And the new principal came and said, what are we gonna do about the shelter? He says, what do we have to do about the shelter? It's been there for years, so we've never had a problem. Why would you have a problem? Nevertheless, there was a strong feeling to do it. So the last line got changed from they should, you know, uh, strongly take into consideration to that they should basically note that, you know, uh, note it, you know. So it was, it was kind of whittled down, but uh, there are people who, uh, on the board in particular, who are very, very strong on that. And there's nothing wrong, you know, PS9, uh, the center school in Brandeis have already met with with mm -hmm. the police, with the um, with the security uh, from breaking ground, and so on, and so they're working on it anyway. So it's not a bad thing, but I agree with you that it, there's no basis in making that assumption. And to play in my feeling was to play into fears that were unfounded, where it was not a healthy thing. Nevertheless. You can't cha you can't change everybody's feelings, and um, as long as it's not imposed on future decisions, but should be should be taken into consideration. So should maybe should be taken into consideration to have it there. I'll get in trouble, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know that the kids should learn about it, but. Nevertheless, I think it's a resolution. I, I would have liked our original resolution, but um, I also learned that tabling does not mean what we think it, we've been led to find the meaning. It could have been re, re uh, voted on, but it's, it's not worth the complication. We, we've learned something from this whole experience and hopefully we'll pass a resolution supporting it. By the way, it opened today. <laughs> Ken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, sort of a moot point, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I totally agree with Kay. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wish we didn't even have to mention the school, but I understand the politics of it. Um, on the, uh, um, what was your phrasing, the expectation of some reductions, um, I, I assume that out of the resolution is that we are calling for a reduction from what was it 105 to 82 or whatever no no right? that what, what what was in the proposed resolution the draft was very specifically how to bring it down right and um to my knowledge if there is a reduction it's going to be relatively minor okay it may be the four the fours to threes you know and so there'll be some. So I cha changed the significantly uh, to, to that this should be approved subject to significant reductions. And then it was specific in the next sentence what those reductions could be to uh, an expectation of some re uh, of reduction. 
and mm-hmm. to the maximum. So it's likely to happen. I think it is happening, but it's it doesn't it doesn't make it conditional, and it doesn't the word significant meant it had to be a lot to most people, and to other people it would be too much. So uh, that there's an expectation of reduction. And uh, Beverly was, uh, you know, uh, she wanted to keep the resolution. And I, I whittled at it because I didn't agree with a lot of it. I thought it was unnecessary. But um, to have a, uh, another fight over something, uh, I felt it was better to minimize um, and to, there's a word, a, Hebrew, a Jewish word, make par of something that's not meat or milk, you know, that's kind of in between. It doesn't, it doesn't have any serious effect on anything. Yeah, just to keep it kosher. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you also but, have uh, a, a hand up in the attendees. I, I just had um, yeah. the, the reductions are those being driven by the community board, by local elected officials, by, well, okay. I, I would want them to be driven only by breaking ground. Yeah, I think that um, there was uh, particular discussion and, and movement by the elected officials. Okay, I don't think we we didn't pass any resolution, so we had no position. Um, and so uh, I think breaking ground m- made the decision. Okay, it was relatively minor. Um, I'll just give you a fact uh, citywide. They're not just with safe havens, but with other types of uh, sheltering. Uh, three in a room is not a pro- has traditionally not been a problem. In fact, it's almost preferable to two in a room because uh, two in a room can be, in any situation, can be difficult, including married couples. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but <laughs> but the fact is that. Uh, it's very common three, and there's ne- uh, generally the people who are using the facilities don't complain, and the experience of the providers has been positive. Four sounds congregant, <laughs> you know, and that's a big issue not to have current. So I think there was some some small compromise, and given that people were concerned about it, uh, the fact is they made it clear in the original presentation that the purpose of the numbers was to provide one staff person for every two people and all the services, the budget, you know, would require this type of distribution. And um, so it's, it's a little, it's a little change and it deals with the issue, but it doesn't deal with it in the more severe way. It appeared that it was almost conditional and subject to significant reduction, you know, is, is basically saying you don't approve. <laughs> you vote for it, yes, and, and, and in the end, you don't approve. And that 10 people voted for it, five out of five committee members and five um, non-committee uh, board members when we had the original resolution. Uh, if it had not been tabled, I'm sure that night it would have passed. There may have been a lot of uh, people with questions, with uh, abstentions, some negative, but it didn't happen. So uh, do we need the resolution at all? Uh, If we didn't have one, it wouldn't affect anything. But I think the board has a responsibility to go on record when it asks three years in a row for a safe haven, gets a safe haven, has major presentations and discussion to take it to take a position and to and to support it. And so um, you know, it's. I think the best resolution we're going to get, and a positive one for the project. So that's the story. Um, is, is there was a question in the chat, and it is in the chat. Uh, no, you have a hand up among the attendees. Uh, okay, I don't know how to maneuver this. Uh, is there someone? Is there Alex. any hand raised? Because I can't yeah. see. Uh, yes. There's a hand raised. Um, I can unmute them. Sure, sure. Because yeah. I can't see it from here. Okay, you okay. can unmute yourself. Sarah. 
Please unmute. Can you unmute yourself or are you being unmuted? Okay, I was unmuted first there. Hello? Please, please, Sarah. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thanks for actually, um, I had my raised hand for um, the two questions I asked in the chat, but uh -huh. um, just while I'm unmuted, yeah, thanks so much for having this and for a very informative um, discussion. Great. Thank you for joining us. Okay. With that, unless there's someone who wants to spend the night together more, uh, motion to, yes. Wait, so uh, with regard to Ken's suggestion of possibly passing a resolution to support the funding, I guess what we're, you're saying that you, you prefer going the route of, of writing a letter or having the chair write a letter and well, yeah, because, because we have to, it's two weeks until right. um, this budget is happening. If we don't get some communication out, it, you know, we could pass a resolution and then two days later send out a a um, letter, maybe, and then the electors won't get it. So the effect, it may, we may feel good about what we did, but it won't have the effect we want. Right. So I, I understand that. And so just saying the consensus of the committee, and I'll say as a non-committee member, I support, sure. uh, is to to communicate with the chair and to have a letter written get it out to the elected officials in in regarding this uh this cut in funding and okay so that's right. the and, and, and greg said he was he send me the information so we'd have the details great okay okay onward and upward thanks for being Thank here you, Shelley. okay thanks shelly it's wonderful i this group we could i could stay here all night <laughs> Great, great meeting, such important stuff. Okay, thank you. I think it definitely was. Take care, everybody. Be well. Bye.